Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Financial Independent Show, where today we're going to talk about a topic that gets brought up so much in different forums. There's people arguing, saying this way is right, this way is right, and that is individual stocks versus index funds. Now, Justin and I, fair warning, lean index funds, and most of our portfolios are heavily indexed, but we're going to try to stay as neutral as possible and just lay out the facts. The links and notes for this one will be at the fiveshow.com slash stock picking. That's the fiveshow.com slash stock picking. Well, Justin, you introduced me to this really cool website called Stockulator. So I'll let you kick this thing off and let's just tell people what Stockulator does first and foremost before we start diving into individual stocks versus index funds. Yeah, so Stockulator lets you go in there, throw in a ticker symbol, you know. So let's say you want to look up Apple, you know, you don't you can look up by typing in Apple or you can type in the ticker AAPL. You can pick a specific date and then it gives you all kind of cool stats as far as how many shares you would end up with, what percentage of overall returns, what the annualized return is. And so you can go in there and look and say like, hey, if I would have invested X number of dollars at this date in this investment, what would I have today? And then you can kind of compare apples to apples, if you will. You can compare different companies to different companies. Now, obviously, some companies were publicly traded before others. So, you know, depending on how far back you go in time, you might not be able to compare them on the same date. But it's a pretty handy little tool. And kind of we we're kind of joking before we hit record. I said you can get in there and you can get some FOMO or you can get some relief that, that out of uh, you know feeling glad that you didn't invest in something because obviously some certain stocks have performed really well and you're like man i wish i'd invest in that and some are like man I dodged a bullet and so all of these individual stocks were going to be pegging against vtsax which is the vanguard total stock market fund and so justin i think you plugged in here you invest a thousand dollars we're recording this on august 9th you invest a thousand dollars on august 9th 2004 so exactly 20 years ago and today vtsax the vanguard total stock market index fund would have five thousand eight hundred and seven dollars and that's an average 9.19 percent return right that's correct and the only other caveat is to make is sure i got the with, inputs correct <laughs> yeah the only other caveat is that that is with reinvesting your dividend so if it is a stock that pays out a dividend that you take that money and reinvest it in that stock so we have a google doc for those who you definitely can't see because they're listening to us <laughs> we have a google doc that we're working off of and we picked some interesting companies justin actually did a brunt of the legwork here so the first one listed is intel was there any reason you listed intel justin i know that they were a superpower back then i was looking up kind of just like a timeline and their big announcement for 2004 was a 64-bit processor i'm pretty sure it's like multiple thousands of bit processors now but that was the big announcement what was the reason you chose this company? Yeah, so that was a big reason I chose it was the market cap. So when I was looking up companies, I was kind of looking through two different lenses because I was thinking, why would someone pick an individual stock? If you're in 2004, like, why would you choose a company? And I think oftentimes it's either because you think, hey, this is this dominant company that's always going to be here, that's always going to be like pushing the envelope, that's going to be growing like crazy, or it's a company that has just released some new product that you think is going to really like shoot their stock to the roof. And so for Intel, it was definitely one of those market cap things. They were the seventh largest company. Pretty much any PC that you bought for many years is going to have that little sticker on there near the keyboard that's going to say Intel, powered by Intel. So I feel like it was just a very, it was a company that was in a, probably in front of a lot of people, got a lot of exposure, a lot of people interacted with it, and it could be top of mind when you're going out there to pick a stock. And with that being said, Justin, if you were to invest in the groundbreaking Intel in 2004, would you be beating the total stock market today? You would not. Your $1,000 today would be worth $1,623 <laughs> at an annualized return of 2.45%. All right. So <laughs> again, that's compared to the $5,807 that VTSAX returned. Now, before you guys tune out and you're like, well, these guys are just hating on individual stocks. Don't worry. We have a couple of FOMO ones in here where... The numbers are just astronomical if you were to put all of your net worth into this individual stock. But we're going to get through and go through some of the other really popular stocks of the era. So the next one is near and dear to me, Justin, on this list, and that's Abercrombie and & Fitch. And this was a couple years after their Hollister launch. If you didn't know, fun fact, Justin, I was a model at Hollister. <laughs> oh, that is a, that's a great fact. 
<laughs> and for those who are thinking, wow, you were a model, a model only means that you just walk around the store and fold stuff that people mess up. It's a very glorified model title. So I'm just walking <laughs> around the store. I had a headache after every shift because there's so much cologne. The music is blaring. People were so mean to you. It was a horrible job. But I could see why this stock was going bonkers back in 2004 because it was the hottest clothes. Everyone had Hollister. You had that <laughs> you had that seagull on your shirt or you had the huge white Hollister letters on every t-shirt that you owned. Oh my God, I can't even imagine wearing that stuff now. But okay, into the numbers. <laughs> if you invested in Abercrombie & Fitch back in 2004, you would have a grand total of $4,679 or an average annual 8.02% return. Honestly, not as bad as I thought. I know that far fewer people wear, or at least I thought far fewer people wear Abercrombie & Fitch and Hollister today. Maybe they're making a comeback. Who knows? That's actually way higher than I would have expected, though. I thought there's malls around me that Hollister stores have closed or just the malls have closed in general. So, hey, good for you, Abercrombie and Fitch. Yeah, this one definitely turned out to be better than I expected. Um, a reason I picked it was because, yeah, 2004, I would have been 14. And that is when, you know, I first started probably getting into some Hollister stuff. And we didn't have much money growing up. And I was pumped about Hollister because they would always have like the crazy, like really cheap t-shirt section that you could get some stuff that actually said Hollister and feel like you were kind of being trendy, but without paying the Abercrombie prices. Now, um, I would always have to buy like three and four XL because the way they sized things so ridiculously. And I was a little bigger back then, but like the sizing was ridiculous. Anyway, I do think that the returns on investment was much better than I expected. Couldn't feel too bad about that if you invested and got an 8% return. I'll let you kick this next one off. This is one of those FOMO stocks. The first two, you're losing to the index. This third one, oh man, the index gets absolutely destroyed. Yeah, this is one of my favorite ones um, because we're going to peg it against 2004 like we did all the other ones. But uh, we're also going to peg it against another date that has just always been a hilarious kind of fun fact to me. So this is apple and in 2004 they released the ipod mini it's obviously been a, a hot company already at this point so i think it'd be very fair that someone would want to invest a little money in apple if you want some fomo if you invested a thousand dollars in apple in 2004 today it would be worth three hundred and ninety six thousand five hundred and sixty two dollars for almost 35 percent returns you would also have a lot more shares of Apple through all the stock splits, which is another interesting component. But yeah, that's got to hurt when you're sitting there looking at your, your $5,800 in index funds versus four hundred grand in an individual stock. To think that Forrest Gump has a way higher net worth than two financial independence podcasters. <laughs> if only, Justin, if only. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite all right. uh, kind of little fun fact things about uh, is like we said the Forrest Gump um, the Forrest Gump reference so Forrest Gump came out July 6th 1994 if you left the movie theater and said you know what I gotta invest in Apple this crazy man just said that he invested in a quote fruit company and now it doesn't have to work anymore I'm gonna do the same thing that thousand dollars would be worth 1.1 million dollars at an annual return of 26 percent not too shabby Okay, so the next one is actually one of old Uncle Warren, Warren Buffett's favorite companies. This is Coca-Cola. Justin, I see a big announcement in 2004 was they released C2. Frankly, I have no idea what the heck C2 is. <laughs> Do you know what that is? I think it was supposed to be like the new, you know, like Coke 2, like the new formula. And I think it was actually a big flop. Um, so I could <laughs> yeah. see someone, you know, thinking about this and being like, Okay, they released this thing. I thought it was going to be the hot new product. It turns out to be a flop. And now you're getting all, you're freaking out and thinking, oh man, I made a terrible decision. But it actually hasn't turned out to be too bad of an investment. Well, I know, Justin, one of your guilty pleasures is Diet Coke, is it not? I'm more of a Coke Zero man, but yeah, give me, give me some sugar free okay. Coke in any form and I will, I'll go to town. Fair enough. All right, but getting into the numbers here Coca Cola, if you invested back, in August 2004 to today, you would have a grand total of $6,007 or a 9.37 average annual return. 
just beating out. This is actually the closest one we have on our list. Just barely beating out the total stock market index, which is kind of crazy. But Coke's been there for a while. There's a reason why Warren Buffett invests in it and loves the product. And I think he drinks it every day as well. So hats off to you, Coca-Cola. Okay, Justin, another oldie, but a goodie. I actually, I could look this up real quick. This company's been around forever. One, curious why it's on the list. And two, I'll let you kick it off. Yeah, so this one is General Electric, and it's on the list because in 2004, it was had the fifth largest market cap. So again, this is one of those stocks where I could imagine someone sitting there and being like, they're not going anywhere. They are the gorilla in the room. Like, they're going to just dominate. This is a sure thing. You know, I don't necessarily trust the entire market, but I can trust GE. And so if you invested $1,000 in 2004, just like all the other companies, you would have a whopping $1,243 for a grand total of a 1.09% annual return. So uh, probably not as good as you would have done just putting it into a checking account, honestly, <laughs> or like I said, definitely not better than a CD. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> so Justin, I was just looking it up. You know when GE was founded? 18 Any something? guesses? 18... Wow. All right. You're smarter than I was. 98. Wow. 1892. <laughs> Someone's doing their research. But so like you said, it was fifth largest market cap back in 2004. Today, it is the 68th largest. So GE clearly has some catching up to do with a lot of the bigger tech companies and other companies of today's market. Okay. Another boring type company, but a Titan nonetheless. It was a huge company back in the day. Wells Fargo. So I see here, Justin, it was had the 15th largest market cap back in 2004. Wells Fargo has had a lot of stuff. They've been in the press a lot, mostly for not so good things. So I'm guessing some of you can imagine that the returns aren't great. They're not as bad as I would have thought, though. I honestly thought Wells Fargo would have done worse just because of all the scandals. And I saw them in the press actually recently about them faking interviews to check off a diversity and inclusion box. Just crazy stuff. Okay, but if you invested in Wells Fargo, $1,000 back in August 2004, today, you'd have 2627 or a or an average annual return of 4.95%. So you're doing about half of what the market did. You have about half of the money you would have had if you invested in good old VTSAX. Yeah, and another reason I picked this one is it was a different industry, right? It's banking versus like, I don't want to go all tech, all consumer products. And I know this episode is more around individual versus total stock market, but I do think this is probably like a good reminder of even if you don't do the best with your stocks, you probably still beat out like your checking account, right? Like, you know, averaging 5% returns on interest would be really hard to do. Like right now we're in a higher interest environment, but that's, that hasn't always historically been true. So like, even if you don't have the, best stock portfolio it's better than just like putting your money into a savings account and letting it sit there and earn nothing justin this next one on the list surprised me i haven't heard of this company since i was in high school <laughs> maybe algebra or calc or one of those ti all i know about ti is they make the calculators is that all they do today because we'll get into the percentages and the returns in a second but seriously they surprised me a lot they're doing a lot better than i would have expected yeah, I was looking up products that came out in 2004 and the TI-89 was listed. And I remember like the TI-89 because our school was, I think we had to use TI-82s. Like we were, we had like the really old stuff. And I remember like going to an ACT and seeing kids who had TI-89s. But like, damn it, like these, like they got, they got all the good stuff. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, like the TI, the TI calculators was just such a vivid memory for me of like taking the ACT. And so I thought, yeah, let's look them up. I completely thought that this would be a huge flop uh, because I knew that historically, like that they were a titan in the the chip manufacturing realm, but like they kind of missed out. Like they could have been Apple. Like they could have created. You know, they were really poised. They had or all Nvidia. the resources. Yeah. yeah, or in Nvidia, but they really had like all the resources and like from sensors and different things where they could have developed something like an iPhone. Um, because they weren't just typecasted into a certain kind of chip. They they make all kinds of chips. But the returns aren't so bad. They're actually really good. A thousand dollars invested in TI would be eleven thousand four hundred and ninety-six dollars 
right at 13% annual returns. So yeah, TI over the course of the last 20 years has actually done really well. Are they just doing calculators still? They make a lot of different sensors and chips that are kind of, you know, it's kind of like a, a product behind other products. So other products will use a TI chip inside of their product. Makes total sense. All right. The next one is another one near and dear to my 2004 heart. Sony, the creator of the PlayStation. And I see you put in here, Justin, this was the PSP release date. Was PSP before or after? It must have been after PS2. So I think I got my PS2 in like... After. 2002 or 2003 or something like that yeah so psp must have been after that's a little handheld device and sony was like the hottest company of the time everyone had a playstation xbox wasn't a thing yet there wasn't really any other gaming systems that were competing but sony has since not done so well so since the release of the psp back in 2004 and if you invested a thousand dollars and you're all amped up this is the next big company no one's ever going to take them down with that one thousand dollars in august 2004 today it would be $2,691 or an average annual 5.07% return. So unlike TI, this tech slash gaming company, Sony, did not fare so well. Yeah, I vividly remember the PSP. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. The fact that you could have like a web browser on there and it was portable. And and like you said, the, the PS2 came out in 2000, I believe. Um, so yeah, it was such a hot company at the time. And again, better than just sticking your cash under the mattress, but not as good as that total stock market. Justin, the only one left on the list that we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about a couple flubs and sometimes where maybe we should have, or maybe we shouldn't have ventured into individual, into individual stocks. This is the only one where if you kept your money under your mattress, you'd actually have more today than if you invested <laughs> in this company. And that company is Nokia. <laughs> So I was looking, Justin, do you have a guess how many phones Nokia released in 2004? <laughs> this is just comical thinking about today's phone market. Well, it's not fair because you already told me how many, but it, it's a lot. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. I thought you were going to make a fake guess for the audience's sake, but audience, you don't know. And you're wondering and you're, you're, you've got the drum roll in your head. They released nine phones in 2004, nine <laughs> phones, which is just ludicrous. <laughs> But since 2004, Nokia has had a steady decline, a steep and steady decline. If you invested $1,000 into Nokia in August 2004, that $1,000 would now be $730, or a negative 1.56 average annual return. The worst one of the bunch so far. If we picked Enron or some other bankrupt company, then your money could go to zero. But this is pretty bad. This is worse than putting your money under the mattress. Especially because, I mean, it... It's not like it was some random penny stock or some stock that just came out of nowhere. Like this was a legitimate titan of the industry. And then to return negative 1.56% interest is uh, is pretty wild. So that's the last one we had on the list of the, the 2004 ballers. <laughs> this was basically we typed in and we just looked for all the big releases, all the big press from 2004, new products, new technologies. And also, we threw in a couple with large market caps. But Justin, I think it would be fun to just talk about our individual stock investing experience for a little bit. So I've had some wins. I've had some losses. I know you've had some wins and losses. But I put these screenshots in our shared doc. So these two companies, I probably put at the time what, w what would be 30 to 40% of my net worth in each of these stocks at different times. So the two stocks previously called Valiant Pharmaceuticals, now it's Bosch Health Companies. And the second one is Alliance Resource Partners, which is like a coal mining company. So Valiant Pharmaceuticals came first. I think I bought in around 200 or maybe 180. And then it went up to like 270. And I remember selling some and thinking I was on top of the world. And then it started tanking and going back down. I think I sold most of my shares in the mid 100s. Today, that stock is trading at $5.42. And this is without stock splits. This isn't the good $5.42 and they split 100 <laughs> times. No, this is just straight up. You lost like all of your money. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a rough one. And it's another one of those things where it's so hard not to kind of get greedy. Like you said, you buy in at maybe 180 and then you see it up to 270 and you're thinking, yeah, but what if it gets to 550 or, you know, like what if it just keeps going? <laughs> yeah. And it's easy to fall into the narratives too, because I remember there was so much hype 
So they were a pharmaceutical company, and they had some drugs in stage two or stage three development, which is close to getting to market. Stage four is like the last testing process, basically. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, like this drug is going to be it. It's going to cure cancer. It's going to cure Alzheimer's, some uncurable disease. I can't even remember what it was at this point. But of course, it didn't happen. And so (laughs) everyone who had all their money invested and were praying on that drug to pass stage four approval just lost their shirt. The second one isn't as bad. This is Alliance Resource Partners. And I don't know, I went down this huge rabbit hole just to give you guys some context. In college, I was a finance and econ major. I was part of these investing clubs. And for some reason, I got on the train that going back to coal was gonna be the next big thing. A lot of these companies are like, we don't wanna do renewable energy. Like we're gonna start using coal. Coal became cheaper. It seemed like there's a lot more efficient ways to process coal. So I'm like, okay, this company's it. I'm listening to every earnings call, reading their 10Ks and 10Q reports. And so I pour again, at the time, like 30 or 40% of my net worth into this company. This is after Valiant Pharmaceuticals. This is probably like 2017. I probably bought in around 18 to 20 bucks, somewhere in that range. And since then it tanked in 2020. So it went down to almost zero to like four bucks. Now it's trading at $22. But this is just another example of if I had kept a majority of my net worth in this stock, I'd be basically right back where I'm at today. It would be the equivalent of me putting that money in a checking account or a savings account. And these were companies that I was so invested in. I was spending dozens of hours per week. I was listening to all the narratives. I was drinking all the Kool-Aid and it just didn't work out in the long run. So even though you can't get super lucky with a company like Apple or a company like Amazon or a company like Facebook, if you invest early, there's just so many other ones that are losers, but you don't hear those people's stories because they don't want to share them and be public about their huge losses. And so we just got through talking about some of the stocks that you may would have invested in if you would have been an investor in 2004. We talked about some of the flops that Cody had where he invested in some individual stocks that felt like it was such a smart thing and it turns out not to be the right thing. Um, But, you know, we also talked about in part of that, like some of the FOMO, like, oh, you hear about people because that's all they want to talk about is their wins. You hear about people who did invest in Apple like 10 years ago and made all this money. And oftentimes like that's first, that's people's like first exposure to the stock market is maybe they took a chance and invested on one company and it just so happened to either do really well or really poorly. Like I invest, I had a flop where I invested in Luminar, which is supposed to be a technology, uh, you know, related to like self-driving cars. And it goes from $33 down to like 90 something cents. If that was the, my very first exposure to investing, maybe especially when your confidence is already kind of shaky on like, do I, should I be doing this? That might like set you back forever where you like never feel confident really investing. And on the flip side, if you just happen to invest in something that does really well, it might give you this false sense of confidence of like, I can't miss. And I wish I wouldn't have only put this small percentage in. I should have put everything in. And then the next time you make that big bet and it goes south. So that's to me one of the the biggest differences between individual stocks and index funds is it can set a really bad precedence both you know in a positive and kind of a negative way as far as you getting overconfident or overly scared because it comes with so much volatility versus a total stock market um, which is just not going to move the same amount that an individual stock will. And not only the volatility, but you almost get attached to the stocks. I wasn't kidding. When I was doing dozens of hours of research every week on my individual stocks, those are just two of the ones I mentioned, but I would you know, wake up at night and check the tickers. It was crazy. Like I would literally go on my investing app on my phone and check the tickers at like four in the morning when the market's not even trading to see if there's like after hours <laughs> movement. Like it was insane. And there was actually a study done by Fidelity and the people who had the best performing portfolios were dead people who still had their accounts with Fidelity (laughs) because they weren't trying to time the market. They weren't looking at how their stocks were doing. They weren't panic selling. They weren't panic buying. So it's seriously just the set it and forget it mentality. It sounds so much easier than it actually is in practice, but it's less tempting to do if you just have good old VTSAX or some other index fund rather than some company where you're so invested and you're reading every article and, oh my gosh, the CEO just said this, or they're releasing this new thing next year. And you just get so bought into the hype or you get bought into something went wrong and now you want to sell all your shares. It's a lot easier to not get dragged into all that stuff when you're just investing in index funds. And at the end of the day, you know, why are we all, most of us doing this? We're doing this so that we can go and do the vacations and enjoy the time with friends and family and the things that we really love to do. And that's just taking us one step further from that. Like you're always going to be getting sucked into the different narratives and the different news releases 
when you have these individual stocks. So even if there was a chance for you to outperform, which is very small, you're not taking into consideration how many hours of your life you're wasting on this. Like you're not giving any value to the time that you're spending on all this research and the stress that comes with it. Now, that's not to say that there's not a place uh, for you to do a little bit of individual stock investing. Like maybe you need to kind of scratch that itch. But I think that if you do want to do that, it's really important to set like non-negotiable limits. So you might want to say, hey, 90, 95% of my portfolio will always be index funds. I'm okay taking five, 10% and experimenting with it and just seeing like, how does this go? Like, cause I've just got to know. And I think that's personally, I think that's okay. Like everybody has different hobbies and they have different things that aren't money makers. If it keeps you kind of sane and keeps you in the game, then I think that's okay. But you just really have to set those limits. Like you can't sit there and say, oh man, that worked really well. Let's double, triple, like let's go for it. You cannot get greedy. And in practice, Justin, I know you've had some big wins with one with Bitcoin, which isn't a stock, but nonetheless, and one with Apple. I know in the past you've mentioned you've basically taken all of your profits and then probably reinvested into something like index funds and just left your principal in there. So you can't ever get below zero. Is that how you do it? That's what I did. Yeah. So with Ethereum, yeah, I took all my profits and... Um, oh, Ethereum. Pulled- okay. Not Bitcoin. And, and pulled those out and invested in like total stock market and just let the principal ride, which was good for me from like a mental perspective, because, you know, yeah, it looked awesome at one point where I bought in at 170 and it's up to like 1400. But then all of a sudden it gets back down to like $100 again. And it and it kind of can make you feel like, oh, my goodness, I just lost 50,000. But knowing that I had already pulled my principal out and I'm just kind of I'm letting the extra ride made me less attached to it. So that was very helpful for me. And it also meant that like I didn't sit there and like pull the trigger and get rid of it. And now it's like made even more money. So I think it definitely takes that mental attachment out of it when you know, hey, my money is out. This is this is play money now. This is money that I wouldn't have had if I would have taken this chance. And pro tip here, so I have a 5% rule for myself. I don't like having more than 5% of my net worth in individual stocks. But if you're betting, if you're making big bets on, say, a tech stock, if you're like, this could be the next thing, I think this is going to blow up. Again, please don't put all your chips in one basket. Hopefully listening to this episode will make you not do that. But if you do think it's going to go to the moon, put it in a tax advantaged account, like an IRA. Because if it's in a Roth IRA and it goes up a zillion percent, if it was in a brokerage account, you'd actually have to pay tax on those gains. But if it's in a tax advantaged account, an account that you've already paid taxes on, then you won't have to pay taxes on those gains, which just makes it all the better. And the last kind of bullet point that I had wrote down, Cody, which goes in line with that not having that mental drag is, you know, sure thing versus upshots. So if you invest in the total stock market, you can look at any 20 year period. You've always seen that upward climb. You've you've always done well. And obviously that's not true with individual companies. And I think most people who are in this space and listening to these podcasts, you have a good savings rate. Like You have a path towards early retirement a very surefire path towards early retirement. You could go out there and you could try to do something, you know, exotic and get there like super fast. Or you might find yourself like never getting there. Or you could just take this sure thing that's still very fast. And to me, there's a lot of, to me, there's a lot of comfort in that. I mean, I did it the most brute force way possible. Like I didn't do it through real estate. I didn't have an inheritance. I didn't have a crazy earning job for most of my career. The last like three years, I made really good money. I just saved and did this method and still retired at 33. And so I think if you take that and just say, hey, I got this sure thing that can still get me there really fast. I personally think there's a lot of power to that. Now, you could argue whether or not you want to be more of a market investor versus real estate or entrepreneurship. That's a whole different discussion. But if you are going down this path of, of, like, hey, I just want to put my money into companies. I think the total stock market route is just really comforting and knowing that you can still get there very, very fast. And once your savings rate begins super high, it starts to matter less and less what your percentage returns are. You just don't want to be losing money at that point. I'm so glad you made that final point. That was one of the last things I wanted to say in this episode was that early on in your journey, 
the amount that you save matters so much more than the percent return you're getting. Like someone who, let's say there's two people making $100,000 over the course of this 20 years. And let's just say their income didn't go up for whatever reason, just for sake of example. And But one person saving 50% and one person saving 10%. If the person saving 50% invested all of their money into, say, Abercrombie & Fitch or even Intel, they're going to outperform the person saving 10% who put all their money in the total stock market. So while all this definitely does matter, and I think a lot of it is just the mental gymnastics of keeping track of individual stocks versus index funds. But even if you want to dabble in individual stocks and maybe you want to do a little bit more than Justin and I are even suggesting, your savings rate is what matters most. So if you could pump that savings rate sky high and still dabble in maybe more individual stocks than you maybe should, you're still going to come out pretty good on the other end. Well, Cody, this was a lot of fun to do this kind of episode and kind of going back into time and looking at some of the product releases and trying to put your brain in, trying to put yourself in the position of someone in 2004 who's about to hit buy on some of these stocks, probably on a much crappier web interface than the slick Robin Hood that we have today. Um, <laughs> so this is a very fun episode. Um, fun fact, if you're listening to this today on release date, uh, August 14th, um, I am on my way to Houston, where I will then be flying ultimately to Tanzania to hike Kilimanjaro. So wish me luck. Hopefully I didn't make a bad <laughs> bet by going to hike uh, the fourth largest mountain in the world without doing any hiking training. <laughs> <laughs> I see you at F45, Justin. You're in shape. You'll be able to make it. <laughs> but we'll definitely have to check back in with you afterward. How long are you gone for? Two weeks. Two weeks. All right. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Justin will be hiking Mount Kilimanjaro. We'll wish him all luck and we'll check back in with you when you get back.